Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I would like to invite uh, Peter Blaskos uh, to give us his normal words of wisdom. Occasional blessing of fine summer weather, making our isolation a bit more cheerful for elderly ones who still need to be careful. But the treasure is broke, the economy is weak, so let Rory give some hope to an outlook that's bleak. As managing wealth, his firm knows how to do ever since they started in 1762. Thank <laughs> you very much for that, Peter. Well done. Now, I'm going to invite uh, Rory, as I introduce him, to start sharing his slides, I think. So our speaker tonight is Rory Kerstorfen, who works with Bruin Dolphin, who is, um, and, you, and Bruin Dolphin are one of the UK's leading wealth managers. Now, I got to know Rory many years ago when he worked with UBS. And while at UBS, Rory supported an application I submitted to UBS's charitable foundation for funding for world child cancer. This was successful and a grant of $2 million was received, which has saved the lives of so many children in Ghana and beyond. I am therefore delighted to invite Rory, who is speaking to us from Spain this evening, and he's going to unravel the mysteries of the investment market. Rory, over to you. Thank you, Gordon. Well, I'll certainly try my best. Um, and uh, Peter, can I just say thank you very much for that wonderful uh, poem. That was uh, 1762, because often people say to me, Rory, what is 1762 on your business card? And it is because Bruin Dolphin were founded in 1762. So that was very nicely picked up there. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about a few things uh, today, but um, I, I thought perhaps in terms of background, Gordon very, very kindly said a few words and you know, what we were able to do at UBS was, was fantastic, it was a wonderful cause and uh, it, it is great to be able to do those things in such big institutions. Um, in terms of my background, I've been in finance for around 20 years or so, advising a, a wonderful range of clients um, with very diverse but predominantly entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, judging by some of the accents on this call, some of you may have picked up my dulcet tones are from up north. Um, my parents and brother still live up in Edinburgh, and I hope to be up there in about three weeks or so, providing a, Nicola allows me after my wee, wee trip here to Spain. Um, for university, I dabbled south uh, of the, uh, the border, so went to the Durham uh, for three wonderful years there, and continued my journey south down to London uh, to move into finance working for a company such as Climot Benson, and then as Gordon mentioned, uh, UBS. And then in 2018, was invited to join 1762 from Bruin Dolphin, when they launched a new office in the West End. Um, the reasons for my move were, it is very much focused on individual clients and around wealth advice, which I think is increasingly important. Um, it's, it's also quite good fun. Um, we enjoy talking to our clients about these things. Uh, involving such things such as catastrophe planning, you know, wills, make, please everybody make sure you've got a will in place, lasting power of attorney, little things, we don't do them, but we just make sure that they're there. Tax efficient investing, increasingly important. And, you know, there's a lot of money being produced at the moment. We're going to have to pay for it somewhere. Um, perhaps on your talk in, in, a couple of, in a couple of weeks time um, on the Brexit strategy that might pop up there. Uh, retirement planning or what we call it sort of financial independence. When is that time right? How much do we need? Cash flow modeling, it's, it's, it's quite a key tool. And then finally is estate planning. For those, for those who are fortunate enough, looking at that, keeping the flexibility, um, passing on, on to the next generation. Outside of work, I have three children who are upstairs and keeping quite quiet, thankfully at the moment. They are aged 12, 10 and six. Um, thoroughly enjoy spending time with them in the garden, running around, although homeschooling wasn't Quite so enjoyable. Um, I also play a bit of golf, tennis, and when allowed, enjoy a bit of gardening. So I'm going to come on to my slides now, which you can see above, and hopefully that flicks on what we're going to cover today. So really, we want to understand the impact of the coronavirus on the investment market since the beginning of the crisis. Secondly, to get an insight on the potential shape of the recovery and how things may change for investors over the long term. And finally, to see how portfolio construction may be impacted by the changes brought on by the virus. So to do this, 
we're going to cover a few areas. Equities, most people are pretty up to speed, I think, on, on the equity market. Um, the bond market, which a lot of clients have in their portfolios and don't necessarily know too much about. So we'll try and cover a little bit about that. And then dollar up in their currency. What's happening in the currencies? Um, we saw sterling weaken quite a bit in 2015 on the, uh, the, the thoughts, the beliefs that we may well have uh, decreased interest rates, but that uh, has continued. And then obviously on Brexit. What has changed since COVID-19? The policy response uh, is important. The speed of the response. So we'll cover that. Business attitudes and their balance sheets. Uh, and what are the implications when building client portfolios? I think really important is this concept of financial repression, which has been around for a long time, but it's growing in importance, becoming a central tenor of what the market is expecting, rightly or wrongly, about the future. Income, increasingly important, and it's one that we're going to look at, particularly with the UK market, how that compares to the, the S&P um, and what's happening, because dividend yields are being cut quite significantly. And then the tactical asset allocation, where are the best opportunities? So this is just a holding slide, but so that, that, please don't sort of read into it. I, I had a run through my father earlier on and he said, Rory, what on earth is this? Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Well, there are gonna be slides which will come on to shortly, which will be showing market activity. Um, but the reason I'm uh, this holding slide is really to put it into a bit of context and what is actually driving the market currently. Um, of great importance for all bear markets, bear market being when, it, when an equity market falls 20%, is the recession. And almost invariably it coincides with the US recession. So it's important to note that we are currently in a recession and it's gonna be an incredibly deep recession. It's quite probable that we could be 30 to 40% 30 to 40% reduction in GDP. Looking at the interplay between equity markets and economics, you would therefore expect this to be a very grim scenario for the equity markets. And whilst they are down, it's by no means down as, as, down as far as one would expect. And in fact, looking at the markets you know, this morning, the S&P is actually only down 2% year to date. The S&P 500 being more of this industrial uh, type market that you've got in, in the US with the 500 largest companies. The NASDAQ, which has got more of the technology type companies, is actually up 21% year to date, which, which just seems extraordinary. And yet the FTSE, I'm afraid we're down 18% year to date. So there's quite a disparity across markets. Why is this the case? Well, bear markets tend to last a long time and they tend to fall quite sharply. The reason for that, well, there's, there's a few major reasons, is that it takes a while to determine when the recession is there. There's normally quite a bit of debate about it. So therefore, if there's money stimulus, that takes time for that to come into the situation. And actually only last year, we were talking about it, um, you know, at Bruin, and we were sort of looking at the US environment in 2020, oil price potentially coming off, there could potentially be a recession, but nothing, nothing along the lines of what we're seeing here, and obviously for completely different reasons. But the reason I mention this is because this is a very visible recession. You know, people were actually saying that it's a self-induced recession. The government has pushed the, econ the economy into recession as a mechanism for fighting COVID. And that changes quite a few things, particularly on the policy response. Now it's clear to central banks across the world that it's gonna be a very deep recession. So they have come firing everything. You know, the Fed, we've said, you cannot beat us. The, the COVID will not beat us. So it's a lot of it's about confidence. It's the speed and clarity that they've injected money into the system has removed uncertainty from the equity market. And often it's the uncertainty that really causes markets to fall. And so the confidence is slowly but surely coming back. So the knowledge that the recession was coming, the knowledge that the, stim the stimulus is there to try and fight it, successfully or unsuccessfully, we shall see. And the third piece of knowledge that there is very likely going to be a reasonably sharp recovery and I'll comment on the various shapes that have been banded around with the alphabet uh, letters. But the fact that it is a sharp recovery is, is also key. And that's why we think things that, you know, are holding up significantly better than one might expect. So I'm gonna show now the equities chart. 
So just can you all, if a thumbs up, if you can, if you can see that reasonably clearly. Thank you. Love it. Um, so we're going to have a little look at what's going on in the markets here. On the left hand side, we've got the FTSE 100, which covers the last 10 years. The blue line shows the capital return. So that is just the, the indices, where the indices is after that 10 year period. The orange line shows the total return. The total return being the capital return, so the index plus the dividend that's come back. So the, and this is assuming that the dividend is reinvested. Whilst we've had a bit of a bounce back, we are still at the same level as we were basically at five years ago. We're now at 6,200, we were there about five years ago. So whilst that might not be the most cheering news for those who are holding the FTSE, there is the upside in that you've got the, the dividend and the yield in the FTSE 100 is higher than pretty much every other market. It's known for having the high yields. In fact, going back right to the last decade, even though the index level itself hasn't made much progress over that 10 years, you've had, you can see by that orange line that you've actually had a pretty reasonable return by reinvesting those dividends. And it's certainly been a better way than, than holding cash. On the right hand side, we've got the S&P 500. So that's, that's over to America again. And the blue line, again, shows capital. The orange line is the total returns. And as you can see there, the gap is significantly less. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the S&P perform slightly better. Some of the difference between the two is explained by the currency, but the main factor is that the UK has more defensive sectors, such as retail commodities, your likes of your BP, your Royal Dutch Shell, Rio Tinto, your Vodafones, and very little in the healthcare and technology sector. The US is much more growth orientated um, and it, again features heavily in technology and healthcare. I think it's worth mentioning this income aspect of it um, and the disparity between the two. The other reason is that in the US there are various tax reasons and due to the nature of their business is they're encouraged to act any excess profits to buy back shares. So that means more of the returns comes from earning growth rather than dividend growth. And I think when we look at the disparity between the two markets, it is worth including that income aspect of it. Now we're gonna look at the bond market and see what's happened here. So this is looking at the left, uh, the left hand side, looking at government, government bonds. And again, that blue line is showing the capital return on gilts, gilts being government bonds. The yellow line is the total return, which has gone up quite a bit more. Now, you shouldn't really expect much capital return for holding government bonds, but it does happen when interest rates go down. And that's been the overwhelming trend of the last decade, and indeed, arguably three or four decades. But it becomes increasingly hard for that train to keep rolling. Uh, so as you can see on the right-hand side, the yellow, the yellow area shows a total return you made over 10 years on an, on an annualized basis by reinvesting in the 10 year UK government bonds and the dark blue line shows the yield. The important things about bonds is that the yield, if the yield is going down, it means that the price, the capital value is increasing. But it also means as the yield gets less and less, as you can see with that blue line there, you're not gonna get much of a return. The similarity between those lines is designed to show you that your best estimate for what you're going to make investing in a 10-year government bond and continually reinvesting in the bond is the yield, which is not exact, but it's pretty similar. So at the current levels, it's about a fifth of a percent. The yield's about a fifth of a percent. So what does that mean? So in effect, what that's telling you is over the next 10 years, you're going to make a 2% return. It's not attractive, but it is relatively safe. But these are the things that we're taking into account. And so that's, it's just, yeah, it's, it is um, something that we have to pay close attention to. And as I'm saying, interest rates are only going to go in one direction from here. If we move on to currencies, then this chart here shows the effective exchange rates, showing how each has performed relative to its trading partners. The light blue shows, shows the US dollar. And as you can see there, it's been pretty strong. The dark blue line is, is good old British pounds. You can see it fell reasonably sharply following the Brexit and it's basically stayed at those pretty low levels. 
the euro is the orange line, which you can see has picked up a little bit of it, which is partly it's the risk is going on. But it's, it's in it. with stock markets, when they're weak and people are concerned what's happening, they buy the dollar. They go for safety. So they're buying, they're buying often dollar debt or they're buying dollars. And when the stock market does well, the dollar tends to be weaker as people are looking to invest in riskier assets. So the euro and sterling tend to be more risk on, as we call it. Um, but currently, the UK is dancing its own tune with uh, the Brexit discussions, which may have gone quiet at the moment, but I'm sure that's going to gain a bit of volume in due course. And I'll be interested in dialing into your next, next one. Um, on the next slide here is, is really what is the case of, you know, looking at it, it's all happened pretty fast. And stepping back, what has changed as a result of COVID? And what is the shape of the recovery? You may have heard the V's, the U's, the L's. There, there are all sorts of ones uh, to describe it, but none of them really conform to one letter. There is the idea of a V-shaped recovery where activity rebounds very quickly, the quarter after the decline. And, you know, there's a reasonable chance we may see a bit of this in Q3, Q4. But it's also the idea of the U-shape where it takes considerably longer. So we see a rapid fall, it plateaus along here, and then slowly, slowly increases. I think that, that, that is a, that's what we saw with the financial crisis. This is slightly different. We've already seen all the economy globally, everyone getting together, putting the money stimulus in there. So it's, it's, we've seen the initial V, the bounce back, but I think what we might see is now a bit of that U taking place as it takes time. It's not easy for the restaurants, for the cafes, for the properties, uh, you know, property markets, there's a whole lot of things that are going on at the moment. Uh, and to try and squeeze it into one letter, I think is increasingly difficult. And actually it's, it's just sloppy journalism to, to a degree. So I wanna talk now about some of the trends uh, that might change the markets. Most, no most notably is the monetary policy response. And here we have the good old Bank of England. The policy response to this crisis from around the globe has been dramatically different from that in previous periods. As I mentioned before, this is a very visible recession. So all the clear indications are that the central banks are willing to fund spending by their respective treasury departments. This is not to say that the independence of central banks have been compromised, but it does seem, it does certainly feels like a shift in the approach being taken, such as the huge increase in government spending. We saw the first data uh, when it came out in April, the colossal increases in government spending coinciding with huge increases in asset purchases and, and some QE from central banks. There was also talk about potentially increasing taxes, but it's interesting, the government seems to be more politically motivated in the UK, but globally as well. Um, so it seems to be more political stance than economical. So there's a general sea change to the way that they are looking to balance their books. The whole vibe around austerity is very much sunk away and most political leaders in power at the moment are not followers of that particular ideology. At some stage though, this is going to have to change. To give you an idea of quantums, you probably read about some big, some big sort of numbers out there. And I think one that particularly struck me was a few weeks ago and they were looking at the US asset buying. Uh, it was $2.3 trillion from mid-March to mid-June. So over that three month period, they bought $2.3 trillion uh, of, of debt, mortgages and debt from companies in the US. Now, while I just have a quick sip of water, I'd like you to think what that actually means per business day over a three month period. Now you're on mute, so I'm safe. I'm gonna have a quick sip. So that's $2.3 trillion over a three month period. What does that actually mean on a business day over that three months? $35 billion a day they're buying, or they're buying over that period. Uh, it's, just, it's just staggering. It's too easy for these numbers to wash away without really actually understanding what it means. So these numbers are vast. The other thing that we're doing is changing our working patterns. You know, I mean, I, I never would have even contemplated doing this uh, from Spain ever actually, um, but sitting at home, realizing how the technology has got so much better, talking to each other, to your colleagues, to your clients, it, it, is, it is pretty impressive. Five years ago, it would have been a disaster. 
Now, I think Virgin have a couple of issues every now and again, but, but we seem to be, I live down in Seven Oaks in Kent, and everything seems to be working you know, pretty smoothly down there. So it means that everything's a bit more agile. People are talking about all sorts of different things uh, in terms of how things will be in the future. Um, but I think one of the, the sectors support this, this particular area extremely well is um, the way that we're looking at real estate, which has obviously performed pretty poorly. And it's creating questions about where the bricks and mortar on real estate general will be the enduring feature, how things work out going forward. And I think that could be interesting. Um, certainly we've sort of said, you know, we're not likely to be back in the office before September. Um, others are saying that they're going to be working, you know, one or two days a week for the foreseeable future. Um, I think it's quite easy to fall back into previous habits, but we'll see how that unfolds. So balance sheets is the other thing um, that has changed during the crisis. So the approach that companies take to managing their own finances, finances. With a shock like this, if you've got a strong balance sheet, it does mean that you, you could potentially be in a position to actually benefit over the long term from taking market share from selective market acquisitions and putting yourself in a stronger competitive position as a result of the weakness that your peers might be suffering. Generally, companies have raised capital. Equity investors have been quite happy to give capital to companies, even though it dilutes them on the basis that they'd rather be diluted in a strong company than taking a chance on a weak company. I think the critical thing here is that we as investors are very much looking for companies with strong balance sheets and cash flows, and it is actually creating you know, opportunities. Now we're gonna talk through what it actually means in terms of how we manage the investments or advice on investments for our clients and how things you know, have changed going forwards. So I mentioned this right at the beginning, and this is the financial repression. Now I apologize for, uh, for bringing up this slide a few, you know, quite a bit into the presentation, because it looks a little bit complicated, but I think it's important. The orange line shows the US market ex expectation of interest rates over five years, but five years in the future. So it's their, their expected interest rates over the next five years. In other words, the second half of the 10 year period. So we use it in investing terms to say, what is the long-term expectation for interest rates? And the dark blue line is the same, but for inflation. So what you see in 2019 is that they're generally expecting to be able to generate 1% of interest over the rate of inflation. In moments in, you know, the moments in 2012 where they expect to generate the same amount of interest as inflation. In other words, you don't expect to save or lose money after inflation. And this is really what clients are sort of interested in. But what is happening since the crisis struck, and it's really the first time that the expected interest rate over five years in that five year time has fallen significantly below the expected inflation rate. So that implies it's financial repression. It assumes that policymakers will try and pay back all the debt they have taken, that they've taken on in order to fight COVID by allowing inflation to run above the rate of interest and therefore devaluing all that debt or, or a significant portion of it. It's, this is for, now that, is, that is for the US, but it's actually very similar for, for the UK, except that now for a few years, our interest rates have been below inflation rate. And in both cases, it creates a fairly dire choice for savers if you're holding cash, which is obviously the business that we're in. So we have to appreciate that interest-based interest -based investments are going to become even more challenging than they have been in the past. Which leads me on to the next slide, which is investing for income. This chart shows the returns for the FTSE 350. So go back to the UK, 350 largest companies um, that we've got, public companies that is, in the UK. And we've split these companies in half with the high yielding companies as in with that greatest yield being in blue and the lower yielding in yellow. So the bottom of the shaded area is the capital return and the upper line in bold is the total return, i.e. the dividend plus capital return. So it assumes that all dividends are reinvested. Over long term, there is evidence here showing that most returns in the UK come from, dividend, come from the dividends, as we mentioned earlier on. But here you can see that over the last 15 years, 
that is not the case and actually capital return is greater for lower yielding companies than the total return by investing in high yield companies. Now, why is that important? It's because high yielding companies are increasingly becoming a narrow group and often existing only to service the dividends. In doing so, we're increasingly noticing that they're taking on debt to service it. It makes them fairly poorly suited to the universal stocks for this period. Therefore, when investing, it's not just the income return that clients should be considering, but the total return. Particularly in the current, for UK, our UK investors, there's a significant difference in tax between the income tax or dividend tax and the capital, capital tax. So whilst traditionally it used to be a case of, we'll leave the capital, we'll take the income, that's fine. We need to be looking at things in different ways now. And the reason so is that avoiding to having to sell down on capital during a time like this, particularly as quite a lot of that income has been reduced as high dividends have been cut. So the current outlook. Despite the recent bounce back, we think equities look reasonably attractive. Yes, it's going to be volatile, but if you're investing for a five year plus time horizon, we're comfortable holding them. And I have given a few reasons behind that earlier on. It is very challenging, but one that is well positioned in, in the near term due to the huge monetary stimulus that we have already, that we've already seen. Short term cut to earnings are not so much something that's going to affect the, the equity pricing providing it is short term, uh, as we've mentioned very earlier on. There's also a huge discrepancy within the equity market. Um, as you've seen the likes of EasyJet falling off a cliff with COVID, restaurants are struggling. We've seen a number of um, companies going to administration, the retail sector is struggling. Um, but actually I saw a slide on the, the S&P, which is quite a nice one, I think, which shows how top heavy it is. The S&P 500, as I said, it's down, we're down 2%. If you, so that's 500 companies. If you take the top five companies, so if you take Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, they are up over 20% year to date. So the, the remaining 495 companies are currently down about 5%. So the discrepancy is, is, is enormous. In terms of other asset class, we've talked about government bonds. You're not going to get a great return there. You know, some people looked at in, in inflation linked, which I think is a slightly more interesting area to be in, but it is safe. We actually find credit to be more attractive as the spreads are wider and particularly investment grade corporate bonds. Right now, when they're backed by governments as well, providing loans and they're paying employees. Shareholders have also been happy to dilute their own interest in companies in order to build that shareholder buffer. So the debt won't default until the equity buffer has already been exhausted. Property is highly uncertain and the retail market industrials and logistics are doing reasonably well. But for the bricks and mortar investment trusts, it's been difficult and it started with Brexit and it's certainly not getting any easier. Cash is, has got a pretty poor prognosis currently um, with the expected levels of interest rates going forward. And as I mentioned before with that chart showing inflation and interest rates. So I think that's more than enough from me. Hopefully it provided a bit of insight and more than happy to take any questions. Hold on, I'm just going to take down your presentation. There, there's the Bruin Dolphin disclaimer, which will-, will and it's Very important, thank you for mentioning that, uh, Gordon. <laughs> I'm sure you're all reading it diligently. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rory, that was fascinating. Um, mm. I'm sure you've raised more questions than answers, mind you. <laughs>